folks. All right, we're setting up for the final session and we've already sat down here. It's, it's to that part of the day where we all have to just feel relaxed. Um, very happy to welcome uh, two of our speakers in person and you'll meet two online. Um, we have Chanel Daniels, who is responsible AI manager in Digital Catapult, which is right across the street. Very, very cool building. Um, we have Mike Nolan, who's an associate director for Open at RIT, and he will explain what that is. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see other two of our speakers online. So uh, I'm just going to quickly check if Mikhail, um, you can show us your face. It's okay if your internet isn't that great. There you go. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic to, um, well, no, I should first introduce. Mikhail is in Hartree, SDFC. He's a senior AI researcher. And Nico, who is our director of partnership at the Allen Turing Institute. I'll be passing the mic to them so they can introduce themselves more than I did. Um, and contextualizing a little bit of their uh, work within or at the intersection of AI, open practices, and adoption of best practices. So I'm going to start with Mike, Chanel, then Mikhail, and Nico. I assume this is on? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mike Nolan. I am the Associate Director of Open at RIT, uh, which is an office within the Rochester Institute of Technology, which is a university in uh, New York in the US. Uh, open at RIT is uh, essentially an open programs office. So if you've ever heard the term OSPO, we're similar to something like that, but for a university, uh, we work with faculty, staff, and students, uh, as well as a variety of external clients and organizations to help produce sustainable open work, uh, largely in affiliation with research. So we work with researchers, help build communities around their work, provide uh, educational materials, resources, and curriculum, uh, to support that, as well as uh, technical infrastructure. And hello, everyone. And so, yep, I'm Chanel. I work at Digital Catapult, which is associated with Energy Catapult. It's, a number of, it's one of a number of different catapults that was set up. Um, and But where our role difference is that we're um, specifically concerned with helping businesses and industry um, adopt, experiment with um, research advanced technologies, which does include AI, but it also includes um, lots of different advanced technologies and like some very technical and complicated areas as well. Um, and so, yeah, my role at Digital Catapult is working on responsible AI, um, which is, yep, yeah, in an organization where there's a lot of focus on like trying to speed up um, adoption of new technologies. Of course, I come at this with a lens of wait, there could be problems as well. Um, and also, yeah, with a background of like working in tech companies, managing problems, um, especially the types of problems where, you know, for developers, they were probably thinking there's this, there, you know, there's a very small chance of this happening and things. And then it, it does happen and it influences people and especially leads to safety challenges. And yeah, my role has, I've spent a lot of time in the past of being the one that's uh, involved in cleaning up the mess. Mikhail? Hello, I'm um, Khalid Mirmakis, and um, I'm a senior researcher in the AI group of Hartree uh, Center. Hartree uh, Center is an um, SUC organization, um, it's part of SUC, and we are working, our, our goal is to work with uh, companies in order to help them adopt. Um, AI solutions and uh, machine learning uh, in uh, in order to automate their processes, and also we are also providing uh, high performance computing facilities to to companies that they want to work on uh, large scale uh, large scale uh, problems. And uh, I think uh, well uh, the the um, Companies that we usually work with can be from small SMEs to large um, uh, companies. So, all, all of them 
have a different kind of needs, but there is always uh, um, a need in all of them. The common thing is like the need for responsible AI solutions that are robust and also there is always needs to use as much as open access uh, data and processes if possible. Thanks, Mikhail. And Nico. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Melvika, can you give me a thumbs yeah. up? Yeah, great. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm director of partnership of the Alan Turing Institute, and I'm also the, the Turing lead for our partnership with Innovate UK on, on the Bridge AI program. And um, I thought of my background quite timely. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of unashamedly uh, doing a plug for our colleagues in, in the Knowledge Transfer Network for a collaboration workshop that's coming up on the 21st of March. That's why my background is like this. Um, just as a reminder, if you didn't hear it, if you haven't heard it today yet, um, Bridge AI is all about accelerating adoption of AI across uh, high potential, low maturity sectors, uh, and to do so in a responsible way. And and, um, and if you haven't come across the Turing before, and again, um, Marvika, uh, shoot me down if, if those things have been said already. Um, so we're the UK National Institute for Data Science and AI, and our goals are threefold. So to advance world-class uh, data science and AI research and apply it to national and global challenges. Um, so challenges including health, environment, uh, defense and security in particular, those kind of grand challenges. Um, second goal is really building data science and AI skills for the future, and we will talk about that as part of the panel. Um, and, and last but not least, uh, to drive and inform uh, public conversation uh, about AI. Um, and the Turing has been, over the last few years, absolutely committed to uh, open and responsible use of data science and AI. Hopefully you would have heard some, some examples today. Uh, from Malvik and colleagues. Um, we do focus a lot of our time in, in communicating and sharing best practice in the area. So one, one excellent example that I'm sure many of you will be aware of is, is um, the Turing Way Handbook, which has become very, very popular across um, not just data and AI practitioners, but much more broadly across the community when it comes to best practice in reproducible, ethical, and collaborative data science and, and AI. So. I'm myself particularly excited about the fact that we've been able to weave in uh, Turing Ray contribution in our uh, partnership with Innovate UK uh, on uh, Bridge AI and to share these best practices in, in, in open and responsible use of data science and AI across industry. So I'm really looking forward to this panel uh, and to answering questions from our audience, hopefully. So I I didn't have to do this for the morning panel because there was a shared understanding that we were all into open source and AI. But I'm going to give you a bit of logic for why these speakers are here. So, of course, Mikhail has a lot of experience um, helping companies and helping organizations adopt AI and machine learning tools. Chanel brings the responsible AI adoption in the equation. We have Nico, who can help us understand how do we navigate partnership across different sectors, and especially with organizations like the Turing or academic institution. And finally, Mike can help us leverage all that collaboration by working in the open. So please do start adding your question. I have already um, curated some questions for our speakers, and I'll make some time at the end to make sure that you have a chance to ask them. So I want to start this discussion by posing this question to Mikhail about engaging with adoption of open tools, open models, open technology. Um, what are some common challenges have you seen companies experience or you think the company can face? And what strategy can they employ in overcoming these challenges, particularly in the area of data privacy and models? Usually. Um the in heart center uh we try to be as um platform as agnostic as possible so we are encouraging people to to try and use uh, open source um algorithms in order to create their models and uh, also use um as much uh, uh open data that they can in order to to train their models. For example, you don't really need to to have your own uh, weather data somewhere stored. You can use 
uh, open data in order to try to make a, a, an algorithm uh, to predict uh, what the weather could be tomorrow based on open data. So um, this is uh, our our philosophy, and um, with this, there are coming quite a lot of constraints. In a sense, people should be really um, careful and be trained on where they find their open source data, how much they, they trust them, and uh, then based on, on this, they have uh, there are different kind of aspects. So you can train your model using open source data, but or open source uh, algorithms. Nonetheless, the models that you create, it's your own models, it's your private um, IP, let's say, depending on, on uh, um, the license of the algorithms. So you can really use them in order to benefit your, um, your company. Uh, in general, I think that this is the, the, the roadmap that we are following in, uh, on Hartley Center. It's so sometimes it's like um, you can think about, about it. You can use what it's openly available in order to have a first step to understand what's happening and how well you can do things in using machine learning and AI. And then if you need something that it's specific and very tailor-made for your own um, company, but it's not available there, then you can either create it by yourself based on any kind of tools that you like, or try to, to buy such a solution. But the, the start for us is always something like it's open source. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, talking about security, I'm going to actually switch a bit of order. Um, of course, the concern is not just at technology level, but also the impact in society and how these technologies are deployed. So thinking about that and also your experience working with SMEs across different sectors, what would you say um, have been some practices that you have seen companies adopt and what are some of the places where it still needs some work? Um, and so, yeah, I guess the something I think is quite um, important for people to think about and actually also for companies to to realize when working with open source, um, open source tools for AI applications versus open source tools for, you know, probably other technology applications or standard ones is actually there's there's still a large um, area of unknowns when we're thinking about the harms. And actually also um, when we're thinking about as well, like what are appropriate feedback loops for you to understand the um, harms? Obviously um, things with AI technologies that we talk about in terms of benefits, like you know scalability, efficiency, um, exceeding human capacity and things like that, that are, we talk about them as benefits, but actually when we're talking about the potential for harm, obviously that means it's also scaled, it's also a lot more efficient, it's harmful in ways that we may not have seen before too. And so what this essentially means is that for any company that's working with um, new uses of like maybe open AI, open, sorry, open source tools, um, new uses of like known tools even, um, there is a there's a large level of due diligence that needs to be done by them they can't necessarily just assume that this is um like you know relying on what's already been tried and tested and what's already been talked about in the community is sufficient and also knowing as well that like the ways that to to approach like problem solving might need to be very unique to the company because of the sector because of their audiences um, because of the, um, you know, the market or the operation environment that they're deploying in. Um, these are all things that require a very distinctive approach. And so when we're thinking about things that have been done quite well, I think especially thinking about this with SMEs, um, you know, when SMEs, are, SMEs tend to be a lot closer to the problem that they're fixing, because a lot of the times it's, a lot of the times it can come from like lived experience, um, with trying to de develop a solution for a problem. And in some ways, um, what this means, this, this can mean is that when it comes down to risk management, um, 
and also understanding the implications of like different risks and where they should be investing um, time and money and prioritizing, which could, for example, be very significantly with types of security risks that they need to mitigate too. They tend to have a lot of knowledge that they will just assume they don't necessarily understand that this is a risk mitigation approach, but say, for example, if they're coming from engineering, they have experience in engineering, their, their approach to working with this is going to be very particular to what is expected of an engineer, which actually, if you're thinking about a large company that's producing something that's, um, that is, you know, ideally targeted for like lots and lots of different uses, like a very general use, they wouldn't necessarily have that understanding of what the what it means for um for these different industry areas so um when thinking about what this means for you know people that are either using open source technologies or are developing it yeah it's really about like understanding the context that you're going to be working with um and understanding where your blind spots are too if you're going to be um publishing things and making things available really trying to be as transparent as you can about like what you have considered when developing and like you know the types of use cases you have considered just so people know like where this is already um like you know where these use case needs are already embedded in in what you're producing and likewise if there's you're a company that's looking to be um adopting or experimenting with different types of open source technologies or data like really understanding where you might have very specific needs and very specific, um, yeah, like risk management approaches that you can't necessarily expect other people to do for you. Yeah. yeah I, you definitely also covered, which um, was something that I found really insightful when you were talking about technology that yes, you know, technology would look very different based on at what context we're developing, but consideration remain the same, irrespective of how big or small the organization is to, to cause no harm and to build with the user in, in mind. Um, and I'm gonna now follow that up with you in, let's say we combine what Mikhail was talking about and Chanel idea for working in, in the open in a responsible way. Um, how does it look like to build on something that is already out there in the open and build a customized model per se, which is not going to be open versus completely building in the open with the community? Yeah, so I think um, I would I would describe it almost more like a spectrum, right, of a, a variety of sort of maturity of contribution. Um, obviously, like SMEs, the many times their first interaction with various types of open source work uh, is through usage and, you know, in a kind of passive way. Um, and, and the way that can develop, I think, is like there's no one specific pathway. You see many different organizations take different approaches in terms of uh, what involvement makes sense for them. Uh, when we work with different researchers, different companies, and different institutions that are trying to understand what their pathway to utilizing and producing and, you know, doing open the right way, uh, we generally think about two goals that they have. Uh, the first goal is how do they envision sharing infrastructure costs with other organizations? Um, Shared infrastructure costs, in our opinion, is one of like the predominant drivers of why people collaborate in open source ways. By you know not maintaining a software library all on your own, but rather uh, having shared maintenance across a number of organizations. This is a huge benefit to your organization, cost savings, and efficiencies. The other aspect is some form of value proposition to you know a stakeholder or end user. Uh, in what ways does being open uh, you know, create additional value to these people that you care about, uh, whether it's through transparency, uh, ease of access to things like your developer team, or, you know, other ways of having, you know, greater collaboration across industries and stuff like that. Uh, by identifying these two sort of areas of needs, uh, you can then begin to develop like a strategy in terms of what achieving that means for you. Um, and so, you know, 
for our team, we have a sort of evidence-based approach where we'll interview different people involved uh, to collect data in terms of like what that collaboration looks like, what are the potential barriers involved, and what sort of resources are need to, needed to overcome them. But at the core of it, identifying who you're sharing infrastructure costs with, and then what the uh, value proposition of being open is and to whom uh, are the two sort of key pieces of information that everything else derives from. So we did talk a lot about community this morning and uh, a lot of our speakers were also talking about open source at the end is about community and working with your user within the community. And um, of course, that's a challenge we are putting forward for SMEs to consider. So I want to come to you, Nico. Um, of course, we have initiatives like Bridge AI, and we also have the Turing Institute where we are trying to convene different sectors and inviting them to work with us. However, from SME's perspective, and if I could be their voice, oh, it's so difficult to identify how I navigate this collaboration. What would you suggest and what, what kind of some direction can you put forward for them to get them to work with us, get them to take advantage of these initiatives? Yeah, thanks, Malvika. Um, I think what we found is, you know, innovation is typically a, a team sport. You know, no no single organisation can thrive without sensible partnerships and collaborations at different point at different points in their in their journey, especially their their kind of AI adopt, adoption journey. I, I mean, might talk uh, very affably about infrastructure. Um, perhaps where we focus in the Turing is. Uh, enabling access to the right sort of ideas, expertise and, and skills in, in, in data science and AI. And because those things are kind of major reasons for engaging in, in partnerships and collaborations. And this is particularly relevant to, to, to the science base. Um, I mean, from a Turing perspective, if we go back to, you know, where we were formed back in 2015, um, you know, we've, we've focused heavily on, on, on really ambitious challenges, which, you know, which require the sort of national institutes convening powers to bring to bring the right sort of expertise um you know around the table to tackle this this those um challenges so let me give you an example you know we, we have a a very ambitious partnership with the national air traffic uh services uh, and also the university of exeter and that's focused on the challenge of how do you go about applying ai um, to air traffic control to to achieve greener aviation now, this requires a very sizable team of experts from across, you know, science and industry because because the opportunities, but also the risks are, are you know, huge um, and actually responsible AI practices are, 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 are key to this. Um, what, what's been really exciting over, over the past nine months in particular um, through through the partnership that we have with um, Innovate UK and, and the Bridge AI program is that we've been able to start helping and support companies. Who, who want to adopt uh, AI and, and, and make, make headway in, in tackling some of their own kind of business challenges across transport, construction, creative industries, and, 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 and agri. Um, and because the Turing has significant convening powers across um, um, you know, different sets of communities, uh, not least universities, we've actually been able to bring together a, a panel of experts who are currently deployed to, to advise individuals uh, and groups of companies many of uh, many of those are SMEs and and whilst it's still early days we're quietly confident that you know you know this particular intervention along with other offerings from offerings from the bridge AI program and I would uh, commend um, Mihail and the Hartree Center's excellent work delivered on the uh, innovation vouchers initiatives for example um, those things will help accelerate innovations and, and a responsible AI uh, adoption. And, and for companies that need advice, and, and if there are some in the audience, they can submit an expression of interest right now through the KTN portal because the, the call is open at the moment. We can we can share the link. Thanks, Nico. Um, just want to come back to uh, 
similar idea of that there are open source, open initiatives out there that are sharing resources. You don't need to contact us to use them. Um, but navigation could be a problem, which is where you connect with communities and ask them to point you to the right direction. And luckily, folks in here are actually involved in similar initiative. So Chanel, um, would you be able to share some more about the accelerator program from DigiCat with us. Yep, so um, as part of the Bridge AI program, we are running a series of different accelerators um, that are going to be focused on like the four different areas of Bridge AI, which is construction, um, creative industry, agri-tech, and also transportation. And with these, the there are going to be you know some opportunities for businesses to be able to receive support for like things that they're um ideating and maybe they have a lot of things in place but they might just need a bit of support to be able to produce their like you know their their mvp or going even further and there's also opportunities to be able to engage with um, larger industry players that might actually have a a particular challenge that they haven't been able to solve so far and actually get um, like the support SMEs to be able to innovate to be solving that kind of challenge. We do have um, we do have a, one of these accelerators um, that's accepting applications right now in the transport sector. And with that, we're working with Transport for London and a port and a, um, and a kind of uh, freight transport um, company that works with using rail transport. And so, yeah, so I can definitely encourage people to be looking into that and looking, and if they do have ideas or they, they are already thinking about working within those technology, with, with AI within those sectors, um, yeah, there are opportunities to be, to be receiving um, support and as well as like, you know, industry contacts, industry guidance to be able to do that. And similarly for you, Mike, you do provide these very hands-on support to projects from going from very beginning to let's say, you know, getting them to the sustainability stage. Can you share what that looks like? And um, can you also point us to some direction to take that? Yeah, so um, obviously we're huge fans of uh, the Turing Way, which provides a lot of resources and we try to contribute to and collaborate in terms of documenting this methodology. Uh, so first, first thing I would recommend is, you know, go the Turing Way, because it's awesome. Um, but yeah, as, as you said, uh, we work with a variety of clients from uh, small researchers producing you know, pieces of software and other types of work to large institutions like UNICEF, uh, who funds large open source projects uh, that are used within the humanitarian aid sector. To give like a very condensed version of kind of what our process of community building uh, looks like is uh, it's kind of like a you know, a multi-stage process. Obviously, the first part is we uh, are focusing on identifying goals related to like what openness is meant to bring, like what is the value add of uh, a project being open. And the second aspect is we try to, we essentially approach building an open source community in a similar way that one might approach building a product where products are trying to understand what sort of value they can add to customers, uh, what are the, who their customers are, you know, who are the different types of uh, customer archetypes and so on. Uh, and then what does that funnel of them getting involved in your product and becoming, uh, you know, someone who discovers it all the way to becoming like a repeated user. So we take this process and we kind of put it on its head uh, using a lot of best practices that have been developed at Mozilla and furthered at the Turing way. Uh, to identify who are the different types of contributors that your project might have, what's their background and incentives for getting involved in your project, and then what does the pathway of them discovering your project to becoming you know, a first-time contributor to a repeated contributor to a leader. And then once we have this like idealized version of you know, who your contributors are, how they're all going to get involved, we then work backwards and use, you know, design thinking process to identify what are the, like, what are the missing resources that are preventing a person from getting from one stage to the next. And then we design solutions to that, and then we test them, and then we iterate upon those based upon data that we collected from testing them. So just as how product development is kind of this 
continually evolving stage of you know trying to find what are the things that are preventing users from getting from one stage to the next. We approach that in the same way with uh, developing communities, with the idea that you know by investing in this you will be recuperating those costs in other ways, for instance, by having more contributors, which means you have more shared costs on your infrastructure and so on. I am a big fan of Mozilla and really great work um, that you're doing and also Accelerate to Program. And the reason being that a lot of time experts think that this thing is so obvious. And then you present that obvious thing to someone who's never come across this before, and it's the most exciting thing they've ever seen. One of the most exciting things that actually happened in Practitioners Hub was road mapping. When we sat down with, a, with them, it's like, okay, let's do a road mapping for short term and long term. And basically, you know, what you're describing is that how can we make users become contributors of the product that they want to use? Um, I want to come back to the same question to Mikhail, because Mikhail, I am very fortunate that I get to see Hartree developing some of these, you know, skill roadmap and getting companies to understand where they are in their journey. Can you explain some of those resources and work that you are doing that um, SMEs or any companies can actually utilize to identify where they are in their AI adoption? Uh, yes, of course. It's like um, usually, if, um, especially under the Bridge AI uh, program, we um have uh, collaborations with many SMEs uh, through the innovation vouchers and um, uh, what we are trying to understand through first of all uh, understanding what a project will be is understanding in which part on their AI journey let's say they are usually um what is needed is to 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 give them a clear idea all of quite the whole process from how to collect data and then um, what kind of so sources you have to to use uh, in order to build up uh, uh, models that can be used. Of course, one of the things that we should always pointing out is that these things should be uh use quite cautiously in the sense of uh, you you should be a, a responsible user so of, of all of these techniques because it's like uh, depending to the content that you would like to do maybe you have very good um uh intentions but you can use it quite falsely uh all these uh, uh all on um, these tools uh but in general it's like uh what what we are doing is like uh trying to say okay uh, you need, for example, to do um, to to work on. You want to work on image processing. Then these are models that exist there that people can use. Uh, also, Hartree is an part of Daphne, which is uh, um, uh, a program that stores models that uh, are freely and available use for for everyone. So you can try to see if there's a model stored there that is related to your. Um, uh, problem, but also how to search about models that can be used for you or how you can train them further in order to achieve what you want. Because uh, I'm uh, thinking more about from uh, the point of view of creating any kind of AI tool that is suitable for an SME um, uh, problem. And in, uh, while using this, there are lots of open source tools that you can build up algorithms about this. The, I think that's one of the main um, important thing when you explain how you, you can create those algorithms and in order to create your models, etc. It's to be sure that you understand what's happening in each step of those so you can be quite responsible and understanding and understand the contents of how you use um uh any tool that it's available to you because it's like uh, there are available uh for example python scripts to train ai models quite all over the internet you have just to be cautious how reliable uh, are there they are not all of them reliable you have to think about how much they are maintained for example if you want need the tool that to use a tool that has not been maintained for 
quite a long time. That means that you probably, if there is an upgrade somewhere in your, your Python system, it might not be working anymore. So you, you have to think all of this stuff. But yes, I think that uh, with this is the uh, work that we are doing. So how do you try to analyze to, to explain all of these uh, all these things to to the companies and how you then progress forward? Great, thank you. And uh, Nikos, just sticking to this exact question of um, how can organization like the Turing Institute with their with our existing offerings for companies and organization who are not directly involved in the Turing, how can they take advantage of that? Can you share some of our own resources such as AI Standards Hub, DSG and more? Um, do, do you mind if I talk about skills? <laughs> Would that be okay? Of course. Yeah, no, sure. Um, so, I mean, one, one figure of, to me that's really striking is that 80% or so of the workforce uh, of 2030 is already in employment. Um, and so if you consider that, it means when it comes to AI adoption, organizations can't just be focusing on hiring new talent. Um, a lot of the focus is gonna to have to be on upskilling. Um, and so partnerships between businesses, uh, academia and public sector are gonna be essential to, to ensure that, you know, data science and AI kind of augments and supports what workers uh, do in their kind of day-to-day -day role for many, many roles. Um, and, and when we talk to companies, and, and I'd love to hear what other panelists and, and members of the audience think, um, there seems to be a relatively high degree of consensus that pretty much all of us, all workers, will need to use AI tools uh, at some point and therefore develop uh, a degree of, of, of AI literacy. Um, and that there also seems to be good consensus that domain knowledge is going to be the most important thing. Um, uh, and so actually upskilling domain experts is, is going to be crucial. And that, that kind of segues nicely into some of the, the missions of Bridge AI. There's a lots and lots of noise about things like prompt engineering, which, which uh, other colleagues on the panel may know way, way more than, than, than I about it. About. But what, what I basically understand from that is, you know, how, you know, each of us will have to interface with AI systems to know exactly what questions to ask in order to get the right sort of, of answers, which hopefully will be uh, trustworthy answers. Um, and, and, you know, data and AI scientists uh, at a kind of, with a high degree of expertise will continue to be in high demand you know when we talk to our partners in defense and security in particular now they don't think that anytime soon upskilling on its own will be you know will be enough uh, to 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 be able to protect the nation from you know uh, things like uh, particular attacks using using ai for example um and perhaps what people don't really agree on is uh how quickly those ai tools are going to become uh um you know you know, they're going to be popularized and, and, and used across across the board um, and, and where, you know, when will, will there be the data scientists and AI scientists will become perhaps more specialist roles and where there'll be in time perhaps a decrease in demand. I mean, that's 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 a debate that's going on uh, at the moment when we talk talk to organizations. Uh, back to your question, Malvika, about, you know, where the Turing plays a particular role. I mean, there's, there's three examples of exciting work that we're doing that I'd, I'd be keen for the audience to know about. I mean, the first one is we've, we've published uh, an AI framework for employers um, that, that we published that in November 23. That's basically draft guidance that set out, sets out areas of focus for employers, workers, um, and training providers. Uh, it includes things like data protections, um, but there, there's way more to, to it than that. And I think uh, um, we had a consultation in January, which, you know, we're going through the responses at the moment, and we will work with Innova UK on the next version of the framework. Um, I'd be keen for us to kind of share the link with uh, people in the audience uh, and, and be very keen for, to hear what people think of it. Um, the second uh, big uh, thing we've been focused on in the context of Bridge AI is our um, continuing to improve our online training platform which has kind of many modules that are accessible to the many when it comes to, to data and AI. And um, some of those modules are quite technical, but others are, are much more kind of accessible, you know, and, and more recently we've been running kind of live training sessions around operationalization of AI, for example. Um, 
And, and the final one, and I, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, Malvika, but you know, the, the Turing Way Practitioner Hub, um, I, I mean, is a wonderful third example, and there's been lots of praise for the Turing Way already. Now, we're really looking forward to seeing uh, the sort of organization that will apply to the next cohort uh, to, to benefit from the Turing Way approaches and, and, and peer sharing and support. Um, so here's three examples, but they are they are quite a few more, including across our uh, uh, colleagues in in Hartree and, and and Digital Catapult and, and British Standard Institute. So I'm going to continue with this particular question of skills because there are lots of skills gap, and which is where all of our organisation are trying to work, irrespective of what company or sector we are in so from your own perspective and from your own areas of work can you highlight some some skills that you think is strongly missing where the you know next months or years of work might be invested in so can i start with you chanel yep sure and so yeah for me um because i think about this in terms of like managing risk and especially with um and I think a large part of this is really about kind of understanding all of these different perspectives and these different, um, yeah, these different experiences that people have in their everyday lives and how that's going to be impacted by the technology you're bringing. And this is, and it's, you know, this is just something that's in my head, but actually when I'm, when I'm thinking about what this meant in companies, including tech companies um, that I've worked in, as well as other companies, actually, I think the people that tend to be the best at doing this and really having that kind of customer mindset with any change that, that a company is bringing in tends to be the customer service people. And I find that this is not necessarily going to be the people that companies are thinking about in terms of even informing necessarily the first line of their changes, never mind, well, I mean, with recent things that are coming out, never mind necessarily ret retaining them or retraining them when they're actually bringing in customer service type chatbots. But I think that, yeah, so, so, but for me, I think that like as much as possible, you know, the a, managing this with AI isn't necessarily just about what's technical, actually, I think the most valuable inputs tends to come from the people that can actually translate like what's happening technically and operationally with what um, the impacts are. Um, I think I'll speak a little bit more towards the open source side of things. Uh, obviously, I think AI will impact uh, a lot of different sectors in terms of what skills are needed. I, I suspect, at least in the short term, there will be a lot of, you know, de-skilling in various industries, which has its own impacts. In terms of uh, open source, what we found is particularly using the software sector as an example, is uh, the, the open source way of working, the, the, the nature of having predominantly asynchronous communication uh, between lots of different communities, comfortability of uh, working across many different projects without necessarily having deep domain skills in that project and ways of identifying uh, these, how to navigate these very, very complex um, uh, social networks that exist within open source communities is something that's been increasingly important with a lot of the various sort of companies that we've worked with. And so even outside of open source software, there's a, a a term many people call it inner source, where it's using an open source way of working inside of a company. So maybe still working on proprietary software, but doing it in a way that is similar to open source. We found this way of working becoming increasingly important, not just inside tech companies, but now uh, within research communities and other sectors as well. And we think that, you know, obviously we're biased being an educational institution that offers uh, in an, in an academic minor in, in these skills, but we feel that under, understanding the additional skills that are needed to navigate these kind of workplaces uh, on top of having already domain experience in things like producing software or uh, doing design work or product development um, is becoming increasingly important. And so, you know, that's why our services uh, largely rely upon uh, students coming through our program and then using those skills in real life applications with the various clients that we work with. 
that really reminds me of a recent publication that I saw that Singapore government is investing on people who are 40 plus already in the workforce to go back and acquire some of these skills that is essential. Um, okay, I'm going to ask the same question to you, Mikhail, working in the AI adoption sector, what are some skills gap that you see? I, I think that it really depends to what um, the, AI, uh, the, the person who will need to do with AI. So for example, for using AI, um, I couldn't agree more with um, Mike and Sonal that you need someone to have uh, actually critical thinking and understanding, you know, uh, I'm interacting with, uh, as a prompt engineering with a large language model, I'm writing a prompt, I'm having some results. Can I really translate them to the domain knowledge and use it to my company? This is one of, of the things that um, is needing. Then there is another level that is mean, uh, that says, okay, I don't only want to use the, the tools that uh, they exist, I want to further develop them. Then uh, there are skills that are to do with um, technical knowledge and how much you want to not only uh, try to find something online as an open source, but also understand this. Uh, both from the science point of view, but also again, it's critical thinking about wh what does it do, what this piece of software is doing, how I can, wh where is the thing that should be changed in order for me to uh, use it in my company, etc. So I think with these kind of skills that are needed, I don't know if it's like or there is an abundance of those skills, but these skills will be needed in the in the near future in order to have bigger adoption of of AI. Yeah, that is like someone asked me, how do I take this knowledge and apply in my work? To some people, it might be very obvious, whereas some companies might not able might not be able to see how certain open technology is directly applicable to them. Um, Nico, I'm going to flip it a little bit because we have talked a lot among ourselves about, you know, technology development, but technology or AI also affects the business side of the things where it's about business operations. Um, and reflecting on that, what kind of skills gap do you see in the business side for AI adoption? Um, I mean, I think I'd probably come back to um, some of the things I've already said, to be honest. Um, I mean, one of the things that kind of strikes me is, is um, in terms of kind of risk appetite, is I guess organizations are worried about, um, they're worried about regulation. They're worried about future regulation. They don't really know what's coming around, down, around, around the corner. Um, so apologies if I'm, if I'm skipping, skipping ahead a little bit, Malvika. I mean, well, we, we, when we talk to companies, one of the things that they're telling us is, is it can be difficult to to navigate the kind of the evolution of the law and and and, and regulation is what it means to them, and and as regardless of whether they're adopters or developers, um, but it's in particularly true for SMEs. I mean, if you consider large companies, um, I mean they they often have large kind of public affairs or, or legal team who can help them kind of navigate that particular landscape. But as you as organizations get smaller, um, that's not necessarily the case and often not the case at all. So trying to keep ahead of the curve is can be quite challenging when it comes to um, regulation around around AI and, and things like governance. Now, um, one of the things through, we're doing through through Bridge AI is, is kind of supporting a particular work stream on, on AI governance and and regulation and we're also working with the British Standard Institute um, on AI standards in particular and one way that um, we don't have anybody uh, any colleagues from BISI on the call I don't think but uh, one one helpful way that companies can stay ahead of the curve is is in participating in, in um, standards um, development because that often that can come first or that will come first before kind of regulation uh, comes about um, and 
just a, a specific example of things that we're doing in this instance, you know, we we launched uh, some time some time ago something called the AI Standards Hub, um, where companies that are curious about uh, the direction of of you know uh, standardization when it comes to AI can find a huge amount of information um, and also not just information in terms of you know what the standards are and how they can access them, but also a little bit of handholding in terms of how they can engage in um, the process and what's been exciting about that area is, is other countries have actually looked to the UK um, to basically uh, pick up what we've done and 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 use it as an example of things that they can do in in their own uh, country. So I know that we've been talking to the US for some time and we're looking at you know internationalization of of that uh, of those sorts of approaches. Um, I mean very concretely in terms of what the Turing has done in the uh, AI governance uh, and regulation area. I mean, we've been really busy delivering kind of webinars to, to help organizations stay uh, attuned with the changes in governance and regulation thoughts, you know, think thoughts around risk management in particular uh, when it comes to AI adoption. And just as an example, one, one recent webinar that we held uh, which we advertise through the RKTN uh, colleagues uh, portal at over 700 uh, participants from across uh, across all the subsectors that I've mentioned previously. Now, this tells you something about the level of interest and perhaps the level of concern and worries about what might be coming down the pipe. Um, and so, I think the Turing, what the Turing wants to do there is continue to raise awareness and 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 share best practice. And I mean, to look back into your specific questions around around skills you know getting also getting up skills in 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 ai governance uh and understanding how to manage risk is going to be key uh you know over the next few years um we're very fortunate in turing to have a fabulous team which has advised government uh especially uk government but not just you know internationally as well uh for a number of years from kind of research into policy uh, and are now deploying their skills in the context of Bridge AI to, to help uh, industry and particularly SMEs as well. A lot about um, the changing landscape of regulation and how different policies are coming every second day. And we're saying, seeing the progress in European Union and now we're talking about, is it gonna be adopted in the UK? And if so, what it might look like. And we talked about how difficult it is for smaller companies particularly to um, navigate that. And Nico has already touched on, you know, how, how bigger companies or how organizations like the Turing can help you do that. But my question is a bit, different now. Are there disadvantages that SMEs might be facing because larger companies have better um, resources to manage or navigate these kind of system? And how can they actually utilize open collaboration or open source communities to address them? So I'm obviously looking at Chanel because Chanel, we had this chat. Um, <laughs> and I want to ask you to okay. respond to that. So um, I think about this in different ways. Like, firstly, thinking about this from that perspective of regulation, like the online safety bill, um, and I think that that's that's a really interesting approach to to be to have in mind. Like, well, actually, that I do have in mind when talking to SMEs, because there's something that's very embedded in that approach, which is that you know you have a level of procedural accountability and. It's really based on you being able to demonstrate how much you are trying and using, you know, the resources you have available to be thinking about the risks and addressing risks. Um, and as an SME, it's not expected that you'll be able to do exactly the same thing as a large, a large tech company. But yeah, you, you do still have a level of accountability for the procedures you have in place to be, to be um, working on the problems. So that's one aspect of this. Um, but then there is another aspect that is that obviously is embedded in the EU AI, the, like, the EU AI Act, but also how with how we would be thinking about risk as a whole with AI applications, which is that there are some things that companies want to be able to do, but the level of risk is so high for you to actually think about approaching that and building a business around it you do need to be able to like 
factor in the amount you're going to need to be able to spend on managing the risks, regardless of what your size is. And this actually, of course, this will this does lead to um, a higher bar for, for participation for some SMEs in some sectors. But the reality is that if you if you can't raise investment, you can't afford to be able to manage some of those risks, especially the ones that are probably in that, you know, the, the higher risk categories of the EU AI Act, then you shouldn't be putting a product on the market because the risk to society is actually much more significant than your, you know, your ability to easily compete in the sector. So yeah, these are these are just things that I do think about when thinking about like, you know, SME disadvantage maybe is a different is is not such a great way to think about it. But I think in some ways, like the level of harm can be so high, you have you can't go into it unless you can actually manage the risks. Someone asked me, do we even need regulation? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because from a lot of SMEs perspective, they consider the exhaustion of this their resources as a slowing down innovation. Whereas what you're talking about, that ultimately we have we all have to be responsible for society. Mike, you want to add something to it? Yeah, I mean, first of all, great answer. Uh, <laughs> I would I would echo all of that. There, there's a reason why you don't have like people building airplanes in their basement, right? Uh, we want our airplanes to be safe. We don't want to crash in them, uh, and that requires like you know additional levels of investment and infrastructure to do so. I think in particular, when thinking about SMEs and, you know, for instance, innovation, innovation and AI, uh, I think when considering uh, things like AI regulation and the impact on small SMEs, it's important to understand that, like, not all AI is the same. In particular, when thinking about, like, open source AI or derivatives from open source AI, you have things like foundation models, right, which are very general purpose developed by very well-resourced organizations. And even though they have you know, a, a wide remit of capabilities, they will also have specific kind of purposes in what they're developed for. And so the kind of infrastructure that SMEs are building upon, the shape of that infrastructure and the function of it will impact the kind of innovation that SMEs can, uh, can do, right? So, you know, I've been particularly interested in, for instance, following, you know, there's been um, AI regulation coming out of EU. There's also been a lot of AI regulation coming out of China as well, which has taken a two-pronged approach looking at regulating, specifically understanding the safety of foundation models, and then understanding what sort of liability uh, will lie upon the creators of those foundation models and what sort of liability will uh, rely upon creators of like derivatives from those that are, you know, usually the ones who are taking products to market. And I think that two pronged approach is what I would encourage, you know, those working in regulation to, to think about, because I, I think this is how you can help manage the difference in sort of capabilities between SMEs and then large corporations and other types of institutions that are building more foundational infrastructures that are very expensive to create. Um, but necessary. I'm going to add something. I was looking if Sam was here, because one thing that Sam said from this morning um, is that as a company, you have to identify what is it you're trying to uh, sell, for, inst for instance, and what are other parts of your businesses that you can open up. Um, and some of these parts that you can open up are exactly the processes, ethical responsibility, and thinking about open standards and you know, codes that someone has have built um, that can be integrated in your work. I want to ask Ali, um, do we have questions on Slido? And folks, of course, that's an invitation for the room. If you have question here for our speakers, please um, feel free to raise your hand. Sure. Yes, my name is Stefan Obom. I'm from Oxford, the CDE. It's an interest economic group, European interest economic group. And the question is, I mean, we're talking about data, we're talking about AI. We will bridge AI with the data. But the problem now is that data is becoming bigger, bigger, bigger. So this means we have to talk of big data and how AI is useful to link 
big data. For instance, in Europe, as I know, they started to building something like data space. This is the reason of uh, you have a big data and how AI can support on find the solution. So what I'm concerning is, okay, I see data as, let's say, priority. But when you, when you try to develop the concept of sector, sector this, you have many domain at simultaneous solve the problem. How you do with AI? Thank you. Very simple question here. <laughs> um, um, who would like to respond? Just going to check first if Mikhail. Yeah. Uh, it's quite for me, it's like uh, two different questions. The first one is about how AI can work with big data. Actually, all of these models, the, the large language models, the foundational models, uh, are trained up upon vast amounts of, of, of data. So one of the reasons they are performing quite well in, in quite a generic task is because they have been trained in uh, a, a lot of, of, of data. So for sure, uh, uh, AI is working, is dealing well with um, big data. Nonetheless, this is about resources of on, on training. For example, these in order to trade such a huge model like uh, 70 billion parameters or so, you need lots of resources. And um, usually it's not what a, a business needs. Usually what business are needed is like for sp their specific problems, they need to understand these, my, this is my problem. This is the data that I have. Usually the very tricky part is that in order to make use of those data, they need to be labeled. You need to have some annotation over them in order to make them work for your company. And uh, yes, this is, this is the difficult part because usually there is lots of hours of a video for of video feeds, for example, but there is nowhere someone to tell you this is the part that we are interested in and we want to train in order to, to, to make something useful for our company. So this is one part. Uh, and the second part is about sector data. Now, usually I understand that uh, in each sector, uh, nothing is uh, homogeneous. Nothing is just um, the same for every business, for every aspect of the business that you can see inside the same sector. Nonetheless, um, what you can have is a standardized approach that uh, will tell you if you are dealing with this kind uh, with data collections, you can collect it in such a way that it will be useful, standardized, and be able to use it for machine learning and AI algorithms. And also, it's like uh, by having um, a unified framework that means that you can accelerate things. Uh, by having your data openly available or using openly available data that can be used in uh, your case. Um, I, I thought I would like to speak on what you mentioned around, you know, having sector data, you know, and, and what that means across different sectors, because oftentimes develop, data developed in one sector might be relevant to another. And how do you combine that? Now I'm going to narrow the question, the scope of it down a little bit towards specifically data in academia and in research context, um, because I deal with that a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so you have researchers who are maybe biologists collecting data on like fish in a lake. You have biochemists that are you know studying the toxicity or whatever in the lake. You have climate scientists who are studying, you know, maybe uh, weather patterns and so on, right? And all this data is usually very siloed traditionally in academia. And so what we found is that um, having like impact of research uh, by combining these things together, you create a much larger impact on your research because you're allowing findings to use a lot more resources. 
And so the way we've approached to try to make that happen is to provide additional support to researchers as they're collecting data, right, and generating it through their scientific studies and, you know, various sort of tools that they're using to collect that data. Uh, we're providing them with additional resources to try to consider who the data consumers of that might be. Just as you're like building a technology and you're thinking about who are the users of this like application or tool I'm building, we think about it in terms of, in the same way, in terms of scientific data. And then when that data is used in additional resource, uh, in, in, in additional research, uh, we want, we try to create policies that reward the researcher for that use. Just like how if a researcher publishes a paper and it's cited, they are oftentimes rewarded for that. We're trying to take a similar approach in that sense. Um, obviously, like this case is very focused on the academic system and the system of rewarding researchers and collaborating there. But I do think that you know a lot of the methodologies in supporting people who are collecting and generating data and providing specific resources in terms of finding out who other types of consumers in other sectors might be could be transferable into you know for instance like for profit sectors or different businesses. <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess the data integration problem exists within the sector as well, collecting data for particular problem, but from various resources where standards are different, interoperability have not been considered. So our soapbox of can we think about reproducibility, interoperability, and so on. Ali, more question? No? Okay, great. Hello. Um, I think so we talk a lot about the traditional uh, you know, uh, business use uh, AI today, but for the medical device, is there any way we can approach to NHS database to training our the modular uh, to get the AI diagnostic uh, new tools? Um, Kirsty might be the for, for only person I know in the room who has experience working with NHS data. I wonder, Kirsty, you wanna? Uh, sorry, just yeah. Well, can you repeat the question? Yeah, my question is, you know, now so the lots of the AI tools used for the NHS diagnostic, but for the new uh, tools, so if we want to develop the new products, how we can approach to the NHS? Sorry, so hi everyone. I don't think you'll be able to see me. Hello. Um, <laughs> I, I'm Kirsty Whitaker. I'm the um, program director for tools, practices, and systems here at the Turing Institute. And I founded the, the Turing Way a few years ago, five years ago. It's our five year birthday this year. Um, and I am extraordinarily passionate about open metadata in the absence of open data. It's very, very important that you keep health records private, exactly as they should be, but there is no reason why NHS metadata should be kept private. So if we can get as a, as a country to sharing the metadata in a much more systematic and interoperable way, then you can leverage the power of synthetic data for, um, practicing. Now, there are some areas of uh, research at the Turing Institute that are actually looking into how well can you use the synthetic data in and of itself. You never actually use the, the real data. And I think that's interesting. I think that's quite dangerous. That's very much a sort of a cutting edge field of mathematical research. I think it's very important to work on. I'm very passionate about um, it should take a responsible amount of time to get access to very sensitive data. You should have to work in a trustworthy research environment that will slow you down. You can't have access to the internet. You can't just sort of necessarily spin up as many computer processes as you need. But what you shouldn't have to do is sit around and wait and twiddle your thumbs for the six, nine, 12 er -tune months that it takes to actually get that data. If you have the open metadata, if you have some th synthetic data, you can get your models up to a point where when you get access to the data, you can now actually use them sort of 
with meaning. So the other thing that is also a piece of work that we're doing here at the Turing um, as part of the AI for multiple long-term conditions research support facility is um, working with the data providers. Because to be perfectly honest, the data providers get quite nervous at the idea of just giving everyone sort of wholesale the whole batch of data. And we know that there's great benefits to having as much data, the safety benefits, as well as sort of, you know, overfitting problems. But there's education. So a lot of what the panel have been talking about in terms of skills, in terms of understanding, really fit with the data providers as well. They, so we have some work with the um, CPRD, the Clinical Praxis Research Data Link, uh, which is all uh, GP records across the UK. And um, we're working with them right now to, to uh, leverage their synthetic data more than they are currently using it, share their uh, share their metadata in a way that people can, can really sort of use and understand and be prepared for when their application is approved and also provide training sort of on all fronts to write a really good application so that we are still using data responsibly and it doesn't take quite so long to go through so many iterations of reviewing the application. Yeah, there are quite a lot of NHS uh, collaboration we have, and Kirsty has can share all the good and bad and evil. Um, more questions? One more question I would take because yeah, oh good, James. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, so I've just been thinking about um, the connection between open science, open data, open source, and topics of explainability and interpretability in AI. Um, really, I, I'm coming from the perspective of uh, healthcare, medical models, that sort of thing, uh, which where if, if you can demonstrate explainability, if you can put a model in front of a clinician and say, this is these are the predictions it's making and this is why, then that's really powerful. So I was just interested to get the panel's view on really that you know the, the role of of um collaboration and, and open openness in general in uh meeting some of those goals around interpretability and explainability be because there is a risk that um you know models could be uh developed or techniques could be developed that um are ultimately you know sort of perpetuate this sort of closed you know kind of um uninterpretable approach to ml and ai in various areas yeah um sure i can try um so i guess like what's on my mind um with your question first is actually i mean i can see that where you're see where you're coming from with this level of benefits that do come with this but then i think there's still all well, not always, but I think we do need to also recognize that there's still that um, level of understanding that's needed with accepting that we do have blind spots, we do have biases, we, 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 do, we are already working in systems where, let's say with the medical system, for example, where we do have um, like an over-representation of certain demographic groups and an under-representation of certain demographic groups in, in different areas or limited understanding of how things manifest in certain demographic groups as well. And I think that while it's, yeah, it's, I would say that like, you know, when we're thinking about things like explainability and interpretability and things like this, of course they do help, but that there's also, there's also always going to be a need to manage for and potentially improve the culture in which that's like the culture of the organization that's explaining that so that they're actually aware of what they're not saying and where their blind spots are as well as the culture of the organization that might be acting on what you're providing i don't know if that makes sense no, but yeah <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> i also agreed I mean, I think um, openness maybe affords some additional 
uh, or, or can tear down some barriers, particularly, you know, I think when it comes to like auditing systems, right, and allowing more capabilities around that. So if you're thinking about stuff like more lightweight self-regulation, allowing customers of these services to be able to individually evaluate more in depth how a specific system is working, this is where openness can provide some affordances. But as was just said, you know, it's not necessarily a silver bullet. Um, and there's many more other things that need to be considered that I think you said much better than I did. <laughs> And the only thing I'll add to that is the diversity very much aligned to like, it's not just about the diverse data, diverse auditors, diverse users who are challenging the system and have some guidance to ask the questions in terms of explainability. Um, again, there are uh, in, in the public policy, there are some projects around explain AI and how how can we even build vocabulary to explain AI because it, it, they haven't existed for long. Um, just checking. Uh, Mikhail or Nico, you want to add something to this? Um, I mean, maybe just to say that when we talk to organizations in, in, in the life sciences sector more broadly, I think a lot of the applications be considered perhaps at a kind of triage level to help clinicians, especially when you're looking at um, images for different application areas. Now, that doesn't take away some of the challenges that have been um, very well raised by, by your um, by, um, apologies, I, I, I didn't get the name of the person who asked the question, but and, and colleagues on the panel. Um, how, however, it's it probably more in, in the area of kind of assisting the human, assist, assisting the, the expert in that instance and, and try to help with a kind of with a workload rather than perhaps uh, being anywhere near the kind of full automation, which which I suspect very, very few people would see as trustworthy. We have one more question. Okay. Sorry, just a re oh, it's horrible to hear my own voice. Anyway, uh, just a really short comment, uh, just because um, the connection between data and AI was mentioned, and we also talked about talent, I mean, skill shortages. Um, so what I wanted to mention, because I have been working with um, data learners for nearly five years at various organizations, companies, private public sector organizations. Um, so what I have found is that um, from um, the skill shortages, this seems to be one of the most dominant ones uh, that people, even on more experienced levels, seem to find it hard to interpret data or to ask the right questions regarding data. Um, and it will be absolutely needed in order to develop AI or make progress with AI. So, for example, what we seem to need is like people who are able to make connections between strategy and data or translate strategy to data or vice versa. Um, so when they get a data set, uh, they have difficulties how to embed it in the organization's data context and strat business strategy itself. So there, there's no communication between these two systems and that can have a major impact on AI as well. <laughs> it's a hard yes that's absolutely true one of the projects that i'm involved in uh, called data science without borders where we're working with multiple countries and first thing has been can we map data but can we also map right question we can ask of this data because you can have the same data but you're probably are not asking the right question of it um any comment on the comment <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. I work with a community called uh, Chaos Community Health Analytics for open source software. And so they develop uh, a number of metrics for measuring the health of an open source community, right? And so like one of the worst things is like one person just picks a metric and that's like health, right? And it's like, oh, we just got to make that number go up. So they like do a bunch of artificial gaming to make the number go up, but nothing actually changes. Uh, you know, I mean, academia, you have things like p-hacking and, you know, uh, all this really garbage technique that doesn't really actually improve impact, but, you know, the number go up, so we're happy now. So, yeah, I agree. Sorry. So, yeah, I was just going to add a, a different perspective on that as well, like um, also thinking about the harm, too, because actually where we do have 
organizations which not and, and the same will be manifest in ai systems but we can even think about this even in life with things like you know kpis and and things like this you know there's there's so many instances within tech companies where there's been behavior and like pushing for for things to happen that actually have adverse impacts on like the safety of customers um the trustworthiness of technology but actually still within the company's mind it's like but this is our core metric that we do have to be pushing up and actually you know when we're thinking about um you know appropriate designs of ai systems uh, appropriate training appropriate outputs and things like that it's also yeah like you know when it's being driven by people that might not necessarily have the holistic view of you know what they you know what the the things they're focusing on in the data actually mean yeah you you can have problems occurring With that, thank you so much for all our speakers for this wonderful conversation. Please a big round of applause. Um, thanks.